Tonight begins the yard site of my, uh, my second mother. Uh, her name was Judy Ellen Wernick. Uh, spell out the initials, Judy Ellen Wernick. Uh, and to prove Freud correct, I married Jody Elka Wernick. Spell out the initials, Jody Elka Wernick. I guess I was destined to marry a Jew. Uh, it's a good thing Jody's not here because she really doesn't like that joke. <laughs> I knew she was going to be the little minion this morning, so I was clear. <laughs> um, Judy was my second mo mother. I introduced to the congregation my birth mother, Miriam, on my first Yom Kippur Yisker talk. Uh, Miriam died when I was two years old. My dad met and remarried uh, Judy. Uh, Mary Judy when I was four, and she tra tragically passed away when I was 15. Um, Judy was the only mother I ever knew. She raised me. From her, I learned to love sports, Philadelphia sports. Philadelphia sports all the time. When I got here, and it was the Sixers and the Raptors, very, very difficult for me. <laughs> Um, but I figured I can't lose. Whichever team wins, I'm doing well. Um, but I learned sports from her. I learned pop culture and music. I learned to write. My mom was an English teacher. Every paper I wrote, from thank you notes to letters to friends, you remember when we wrote letters? To papers, everything I ever wrote was redlined. She died before the Microsoft review function Oh, would she have loved that? <laughs> she would have loved that. And yes, we were that family that had a dictionary on the dining room table. From mom, I also learned to tell the truth. She was one of those people who had a spidey sense for honesty. My sisters and I would never, ever be able to get away with a fib. And we learned very quickly it wasn't even worth the effort. One of her favorite sayings was, if you tell the truth, you don't have to remember what you said. And ain't that the truth? The other lesson, or another lesson, we learned from mom was to avoid Lashon Hara, gossip. Still working on that one. Aren't we all? And that's what brings me ultimately to this morning's Torah reading. In the seventh Aliyah, we come across the following. Vatidaber Miriam Vaharom Moshe al Odot Haisha Hakushit, Asher Lakach, Ki Isha Kushit Lakach. Miriam and Aaron speak against Moses because of the Kushite women that he has taken into his household as his wife. He took a Kushite woman. Uh, Vayomru, um, where am I? Vayomru, Harak Achba Moshe Diber Adonai Halo Gambanu Daber. Then they went on and they said, Has God only spoken through Moses? Has God not also spoken through us as well? It's a very strange incident in the Torah. We don't really know what it is that Aaron and Miriam said about Moshe's wife, about Zipporah other than that she was a Kushite woman, and that was offensive. And so the commentaries imagine that it was actually a racial slur. Because if she was a Kushite woman, then she was from Ethiopia. And if she was from Ethiopia, then she must have been black. And so that's what the rabbis imagine it was that Aaron and Miriam said about her. From God's reaction, though, it seems that God's really not upset at all about that part of the incident. From God's reaction, it seems that he's only upset at Miriam and Aaron about their jealousy of Moshe's relationship with God and Moshe's leadership. And you see, clear, you see that clearly in the next verses. God takes Miriam and Aaron aside and says to them, 
Vayomer Shimuna divrei im yihye nivyechem adonai b'mar e elav. Hear these my words. When a prophet of the Lord arises among you, I make myself known to them. Et vade bechalom ader berbo, I make myself known to them in a vision. I speak with them in a dream. Lo ken avdi Moshe, but not so with my servant Moses. With Moses, bechol beiti ne'amanhu, he's trusted throughout my household. Pe el pe, mouth to mouth, face to face, adaberbo, I speak with him. Umar e, and appear plainly. Velo bechidot utmunat Hashem yabit. I don't speak to him in riddles because he um, beholds the likeness of Adonai. Umadua lo yiretem l'daber ba'avdi Moshe. And how then did you not shrink from speaking against my servant Moses? So it's only on the second part of Miriam and Aaron's shmua of their talk that God seems to be upset. And then, vayicher af bam vayelech. Still upset, God steams off away from Miriam and Aaron. And then look what happens. Vehenan sar umal ha'ohel, the cloud withdrew from the tent of meeting. Vehine Miriam motzoraat keshaleg, and there Miriam was stricken with snow white scales, with leprosy. Vayifen Aharon el Miriam vehine motzoraat, and when Aaron turns towards Miriam, he sees that she was stricken with scales. It's a very strange encounter. You have two things going on here that Miriam and Aharon are doing. God only gets angry at the second one, and then it's only Miriam that gets punished. Only Miriam. Why? How does that happen? Um, there are all sorts of different explanations. Most of them, quite frankly, are misogynistic in that in the ancient world, our ancestors believed that women were the ones that gossiped. They really couldn't learn Torah and blah, 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 blah. I mean, you can imagine how it goes. It's not very flattering. And certainly in our experience, we would reject all of them. Um, but what's interesting and I think relevant is Rashi, Rashi, the 11th century commentator of the Torah, focuses on the use of the word vatidaber, which is grammatically incorrect in the, in the pasuk, in the verse. He says the term daber in every passage when it is used implies harsh language. So fitadber miriam va'aharon, right? The, the grammatical problem is vatidaber is a singular feminine first person verb. And it's used v'tidaber Miriam v'aharon. It's used as the verb for Miriam and Aharon. You would expect a different verb. You would expect a first person plural verb to be used in that circumstance. So Rashi points out two things. The first thing is that whenever you see the word v'tidaber, daber as opposed to v'yomar, t'idaber means it's something harsh. It's like this. Whereas vayomar, amar, is softer in terms of its language. So the, the hint of something harsh going on here, something offensive for Rashi is found in the use of vitadaber. And um, the Avot de Rabbi Natan, which is a collection of um, teachings that is contemporary to the Mishnah, but didn't get into the Mishnah, notes that Miriam is mentioned first to suggest that she was punished because she was the instigator. It's not that Aaron perhaps was not punished, according to Avot de Rabbi Natan. It's just that, according to this reading, v'tidaber Miriam v'aharon. Miriam came and instigated this conversation with Aharon. Or as my mother used to say, it takes two to tango, but one of you started it, so therefore, one of you is going to be punished 
more severely than the other. If no one is there to listen, there is no one to speak. And that's why my mom, though, properly, though probably not actually familiar with the Chafetz Chaim, although my father, who is a rabbi, certainly was, but my mom nevertheless taught me one of the Chafetz Chaim's most important lessons, that we have a responsibility to Lashon Hara by not listening to it. It's one thing if somebody comes and says, oh, I got something to tell you, it's really juicy gossip. And this is where many of us fall down, including me. Right? According to the Chafetz Chaim, our response should be, I don't listen to gossip. If you don't listen to it, there's no one to speak it. So, egreg uh, so egregious is this sin that the rabbis inserted two prayers into the Amidah, the weekday Amidah, about Lashon Hara. One is a curse. There shall be no hope for those who slander. And the second, at the conclusion of the Amidah, is the prayer in which we ask God to keep my our tongue from evil and our lips from speaking guile. Naomi Gratz, who's a professor at Ben Gurion University, writes on this. The rabbis recognize the power of the spoken word, word to build or destroy human relationships. And they considered the tongue the elixir of life and the primary source of good and evil. The effects of slander what we might today call character assassination or disinformation, are deadly. Its effect is like that mentioned in Midrash Leviticus Rabbah, the serpent who bites into one limb and whose poison travels to all the limbs. Lashon Hara, she says, slays the teller, the listener, and the subject. Unfortunately, we do not have to look very far to see the effects of this poison of Lashon Hara in our day. Two examples from just this week. Uh, the monk debates took on the question of whether anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism. Natasha Hosdorf, a lawyer in the UK, summed, up, summed it up clearly when she said, this debate is about racism and creating a double standard, where you make an exception for the Jews. Hasdorf said during her opening comments, the genocide libel inverts reality. Hamas has spent 16 years embedding terror infrastructure in mosques, schools, hospitals, and every second house. Its central military tactics is to use civilians as shields and she continued, genocide is the latest modern blood libel, or Lashon Hara, that anti-Semites use to justify their anti-Zionism. And that poison of Lashon Hara has spread this week even more harshly into the Toronto District School Board. Just when you think you get to the bottom of how bad it could possibly be, Something happens to remind us that we're not quite there yet. The TDSB this week uh, voted to include anti-Palestinian racism in its list of recognized forms of discrimination. And I gotta tell you, it makes no sense. Just makes no sense. Rahim Mohammed, notice the name, Rahim Mohammed writes about this. While it's commendable for the TDSB to listen to feedback from parents and other stakeholders, adding anti-Palestinian racism to the strategy is redundant, as it is already covered under both Islamophobia and anti-Asian racism. Why does it cover anti-Asian racism? Because technically Israel is in Asia, right? As would be Palestine. Um, it's also curious, uh, the TDSB's use of the term anti-Palestinian racism in lieu of the more inclusive anti-Arab racism. The Palestinian National Charter itself defines Palestinians as those Arab nationals who until 1947 normally resided in Palestine. And Statistics Canada concurs, classifying Canadians 
who self-identify as Palestinian as Arab visible minorities in its most recent departmental standard. What sense then does Rahim write? Does it make for Toronto area schools to treat acts of prejudice against Palestinians differently than, for example, acts targeting their Egyptians or Syrian classmates? We are living through what Michal Cutler Wunsch calls an Orwellian inversion of fact and law, a moment in which words have no meaning and the poison of Lashon Hara seems to be spreading from limb to limb to limb. Now the rabbis use this story of Miriam and Aaron as the paradigmatic source of rabbinic prohibitions against Lashon Hara. They make the connection as we have previously discussed in our community through the Hebrew of the word leprosy, mitzora, which they read as an acronym, motzi shem ra, from the mouth comes bad names, comes gossip. And from an understanding that once Lashon Hara spreads, it can't be stopped until it runs its course. Um, and so we live in perhaps one of the most challenging times that our people have seen since the 1930s. There are a lot of differences that are not insignificant. This is not Nazi Germany. Um, but the environment of anti-Semitism, the poison of anti-Semitism seeping into governmental organizations like school boards is something that we ought to take note of and make sure that we don't um, allow ourselves to be paralyzed by the overwhelming nature of the challenge that we face. Words matter. They matter a lot. Facts matter. They matter a lot. Words can poison. Words can also heal. Which is why I was so moved, literally to tears, when my friend Reverend David Lamore from King Street Church in Oshawa and our friend and my friend Reverend Jason um, Biasi from Timothy Eaton Church took it upon themselves without telling me and without telling Rabbi Splansky, who's other, our other partner in this, to go to their colleagues and write this beautiful letter of solidarity signed by 40 Christian ministers and they're working in order to increase the signatures. And what I find most hopeful and healing about these words is they focus on anti-Semitism and they don't focus on the war. Reasonable people can have reasonable disagreements about policies and war and, uh, and the nature of war and the terrible tragedy of civilian losses that occur in it. But it takes a mature individual to be able to see the difference and to separate um, one's Zionism from anti-Semitism. I read this letter and I see Christian colleagues who represent thousands of Christians in the GTA understanding that distinction and drawing that line between anti-Semitism and Zionism. It's a beautiful letter. And these words are words of healing. These words give me hope that we can get to the other side of this without too much damage. I want to invite one person, preferably a woman, <laughs> because um, Jacob Citrin, who was sitting there, <laughs> um, is the other partner for this. This week, um, uh, Reverend uh, uh, Numar, uh, Reverend Biasi, Rabbi Splansky and I, and two members from our communities 
are meeting to discuss an interfaith advocacy. How do we get more words like this out into the public sphere? How do we have conversations with people of influence and in leadership positions to see the distinction between anti-Semitism and Zionism, to have that level of maturity? So I need one more person to join us, to be part of this core group, to think about how we make this work a reality. So see me during Kiddush if you're interested in that. Need one person. I would like it to be a woman, but we need another person who does it. Mariana, thank you. Um, okay. Um, at the end of this strange story that becomes the paradigm of Lashon Hara, at the end of it, um, Moshe cries out, El na Rafanala. Moshe sees Miriam suffering and he cries out a prayer of healing. The prayer of healing that becomes the source of all our healing. And he's doing it specifically because he sees the leprosy that she's suffering from. But if you look at the Torah, he's also understanding the emotional toll that Miriam comes to understand as a result of her punishment. It's almost as if the punishment helps her understand the dangers of the Shon Hara. Not quite. But, Moshe, but God says to Moses, if her father spat in her face, would she not bear her shame for seven days? Let her be shut out of the camp for that period of time for seven days and then let her be admitted. Um, and so it's that notion of shame that seems to indicate that Miriam understands um, the, the dangers of instigating Lashon Hara. And the cure is distance, separation, time, and healing. And if we're thinking about the ways in which Lashon Hara itself becomes resolved, you need distance, time, and healing. El na rafanala. That's what we pray for. We pray for God to please give us the healing to, to um, deal with the pain, the anxiety, the fear of this moment and give us the strength to not only be healed ourselves, but to heal others and our society. Shabbat Shalom. <laughs>